So what we are starting with today is um, what's known as empirical formula. And an empirical formula is a formula that has the simplest whole number ratios of the compound. Now here is the important thing to note about empirical formulas is that they aren't always the true formula. So here's an example. If I give you glucose, does anybody remember what glucose's formula is from biology? Oh, sorry, I'm not screen sharing, I'll screen share. So the stuff we just started this week will not be on Thursday's test. This week's material is not on Thursday's test. Everything we did before break is. Okay, so this guy is C6H12O6, okay? This is the this is the true formula of glucose. However, it is not its empirical formula. Empirical formulas are the simplest whole number ratio, meaning can you divide all of these elements by something to reduce them? And the answer is yes, right? If you divide this by 6 and you divide this by 6 and this by 6, you end up with one carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen, CH2O, okay? Now, this is glucose's empirical formula. However, you can't look at this and know that it's glucose because it's not glucose's true formula. It's just its empirical formula. And again, it's the empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratios, meaning other compounds could have this empirical formula and not be glucose. Okay. So for this, we are going to actually calculate empirical formulas. Why is that not? Hmm. Give me one second. It's not letting me click out. Okay, there we go. What was the formula again? What? What was the formula again for the first one? CH2O? What? It was CH2O for glucose. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take percent compositions, which is what we were doing yesterday, and we're going to determine empirical formulas from them. And a really important part is that we're going to assume, right, percent means per 100. That's what percent means. So we're going to assume when we do this that we have 100 grams of the compound because if you do that, instead of writing this as a percent, you can write it as grams. So instead of calling this 38.43% manganese, we're going to call it 38.43 grams of manganese. And instead of calling this 16.8% of carbon, it's going to be 16.8 grams. And this is what allows us to do that this assumption. Okay, so we have 34.8 grams of manganese. Now when we write formulas, like when we did this, what do the 6 and the 12 and the 6 stand for? It doesn't mean 6 grams of carbon. It means 6 moles of carbon and 12 moles of hydrogen and 6 moles um, of oxygen if you have 1 mole of glucose, okay? So in order to do empirical formulas, you have to be in moles, meaning every single grams we have to turn to moles. Now, it's been a while since we've done this, so let's refresh our memory. You have to go find manganese on the periodic table. Okay, it is right here, 54.94 grams per mole. So we're going to turn that into moles. 54.94 grams for every one mole. And you will calculate that out. 
oops, I missed a number, 38.43, I'm sorry. I wrote my number wrong, 38. Thirty eight point four three. Okay, and then you need to do this again for all of the other elements present in the compound. So if you go back, you go, okay, 16.80% of carbon. Well, I'm going to call that 16.80 grams of carbon because we're assuming that the compound is out of 100 grams, so I can just rewrite my percentages as grams. Now, how do I turn grams into moles? Well, carbon is 12.01 grams per one mole. Again, this number is found on the periodic table. And then you do this again, but you do it for oxygen. Oxygen is 44.77. Oops. And then you set up your dimensional analysis. Oxygen is 16 grams per one mole. And you calculate all of these moles. Again, why are we turning the grams into moles? Well, because formulas involve writing compounds in terms of moles, not in terms of grams. So we have to turn the grams into moles first. So take your calculators. Unfortunately, I only have my phone right now. Now, don't round yet, okay? Write out a handful of digits, so 0.69949-ish, okay? You don't round yet because we're not finished. So this one comes out to be 1.39883-ish. Okay, and then again, these are all moles. Okay, so we're at moles. Now can I write my compound? Well, you tell me. Have you ever seen a compound written like this? where the subscripts are these decimals. Have you ever seen a compound written like this? Yes or no? No. No, okay. So we're not finished. You can't write a compound with these decimals. Yes, we're in moles, which is good, but we need to have these be whole numbers. So the way that we get this to happen is to divide by whoever has the smallest number of moles. So which element gave us the smallest number of moles? Manganese. Manganese. So you divide everybody by manganese's number. So manganese comes out to be one, right? So you have one manganese. Carbon comes out to be two or pretty darn close to two. So if you're getting like 2.00001, that's two, okay? If you get like 0 0.99999, that's the number one, all right? And what does oxygen come out to be? Three. I got four. Maybe I'll check my calculations again. I'm using my phone, so that's never the best. Yeah, I still got four. No, I just guessed. My calculator oh. <laughs> isn't working right now. Oh, that's okay. Okay, yeah. so these numbers look better for writing a formula. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm going to write its formula... My formula now, I have one manganese, so I write Mn. How many carbons? Two. 
How many oxygens? Four. This is my beautiful empirical formula. I'm going to call that EF of this compound. It's, its name is manganese oxalate. I don't need you to know that, but that is its name. It is its simplest formula. It can't be reduced. And you go, but there's a two and a four. Those should be able to be reduced. No, no, no. There's only one manganese. Manganese won't allow you to reduce the other two. So this is the empirical formula based on percent composition. Do I have any questions? We're going to do a couple more practice of these before we um, move on. I'm going to do one more with you, and then I'm going to have you do one on your own. All right. So again, these slides just have all the work that we just did. All right. The composition of acetic acid. Oh, okay. Before you do this, you know the formula for acetic acid, but we're going to prove that it's true in a second. Before we even start, can you please write the formula for acetic acid? We just had that on the test or on the quiz, right? Thank you to those who message it to me. Great. Okay. So we want to calculate the formula using percent composition. Yes, I know that you know it, but we want to calculate the empirical formula. So let's do that. We have 40% carbon. So how do you do that? Well, you don't write it as a percent. You just write carbon, but you write it as, oops, I don't want that color. grams. So you just rewrite it as grams. Now what do you do? You turn grams into moles because formulas are in terms of moles. Carbon's molar mass is 12.01 grams for every one mole. Why do the grams go on the bottom? Well, so they can cancel out these grams on the top and leave us with moles. Okay. Who else is in my compound? Hydrogen. 6.71% hydrogen. So I write 6.71% and I turn it into moles. And 53.29 grams of oxygen, or percent, but you write it as grams. All right, does anybody know why hydrogen and oxygen are diatomics, right? But I'm not writing them as diatomics. Does anybody know why? When is hydrogen a diatomic? when it's what? By itself, right? Is hydrogen by itself right now? No, it's partnered up with carbon and oxygen. When is oxygen a diatomic? When it's by itself. It's not by itself. It's in a compound with hydrogen and carbon. So you don't write them as diatomics unless they are totally alone and with nobody else. How come that six looks like a B? Because I'm writing with a tablet and it's not as great as my normal writing. <laughs> I'm doing my best. So what does carbon come out to be about? 3.33 moles, right? Any questions so far? Okay, now, am I allowed to write a compound with all these decimals in it? Have we ever written a formula like that? No. So what did I say that this next step was so that we could get the beautiful whole numbers? Divide it by the lowest one. Good job, Nathan. So now, really, carbon and oxygen are virtually the same number, and it's the smallest, so it doesn't matter who you pick. So we divide everybody 
by Carbon's moles. Now visually, you can probably see these numbers without even calculating, right? This divided by itself is one, this is two, this is one. So then we say, well, what is its formula? Well, we say there's one carbon, there are two hydrogens, and there's an oxygen. This is the empirical formula of acetic acid. Oh, did you already see this earlier? Who was this also the empirical formula of? Glucose, right? So you go, well, why is this the empirical formula of acetic acid? Well, acetic acid is this. In total, there are one plus three, four hydrogens. So let me just rewrite this where I combine the hydrogens. Because this is a hydrogen plus three more is technically a total of four. So look, if you were to reduce this, look what you get. The empirical formula. Now, what's the what's problematic is about empirical formulas is they don't always tell you who the true formula is. So you can't really look at this and go, oh, that looks like acetic acid, because this is the true formula for acetic acid. And we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail and after this topic. Okay. So CH2O. I would like to give you a moment to try the next one. So you should have gotten this far where you turn the grams into moles, you divide by the moles, and then you may have stumbled upon a little bit of a roadblock because when you divided by the least number of moles, which ended up being phosphorus, you ended up with a 1 and a 2.5. And you can't write a formula like that. So do I have any suggestions on what I could do? So right, right now I have phosphorus, one of them, and then I have oxygen, 2.5. And you can't just leave the formula like that. Any, way, uh. any ideas of what I could do to get rid of this 2.5? Rounding. So we're not, we are not, when it's exactly in like the half, we're not going to round it. What's another way we could get rid of that half fraction? Multiply everything by two, right? That's a good way to get rid of a half fraction. So if you multiply this by two and you multiply this by two, you get P2O5. And look, this cannot be reduced any further, right? Because a 2 and a 5, there's nothing common between them. So this is the empirical formula for phosphorus and oxygen based on those percents. Any questions about what to do when there's a fraction like that? Okay, so the last topic of the day is molecular formulas. All right, so someone wanted me to repeat the last one. So what I was saying is that you have to, when you had a, you had a, you got a one here, and then you got a 2.5. It wasn't like a 2.00 or a 2.999. It was like smack dab in the middle of 2.5, which is the same as two and a half, right? 2.5 is two and a half. And you can't write a formula that has a half in it, right? They have to be whole numbers. So how do you make 2.5 a whole number? Well, you multiply it by 2. Well, if you multiply this one by 2, you have to multiply the other one by 2 also. So that's so I originally had one phosphorus, so I multiplied this whole thing by 2 to get rid of that fraction. And I ended up with 2 phosphorus and 5 oxygens. All right.
So now what we were saying is that molecular formulas or empirical formulas are not always the true formula of the compound, right? We know the formula for acetic acid. It's HC2H3O2, yet its empirical formula is CH2O. So you don't always, you aren't always able to tell the empirical formula um, and, and who it is because it's simplified. Um, now, sometimes the empirical formula and molecular formula are identical. So we'll see a couple of different examples. Um, in this part, I'll, sh I'll show you uh, how we'll do it. This n that we're going to multiply um, is always some whole number of the compound. So here's what I mean. We said that the empirical formula of acetic acid, sorry, acetic acid, is CH2O. And we said this is the true formula, so this is the molecular formula of acetic acid. And if you rearrange it, it looks like this, right? This is the molecular formula. So what did we multiply our empirical formula by to get the molecular formula? Well, two, right? If I multiply this empirical formula by the number two, I would get two carbons, right? Four hydrogens and two oxygens. So that little whole number N is the number two for acetic acid. Now we're going to figure out how we actually find that number. So maleic acid, um, is an acid that they use in, uh, plastics, uh, the plastic and textile industry. It's an organic acid. Um, and I give you its percent composition. I tell you also maleic acids molar mass. Okay, this is the new piece of information right here. This is what's new. And I want you to figure out its molecular formula. Now, you do everything the same in the beginning. The first step is to find the empirical formula like we've been doing. That is the first thing you do. So I'm going to give you the time to find its empirical formula first based on percent composition. So go ahead and do that. You turn your percents into grams, turn grams into moles, divide by the least moles. Nothing is different yet. Everything's the same. Okay. So what do you do? Well, very, very easy. You take the molar mass, mm molar mass of the molecular formula, and you divide it by the molar mass of the empirical formula. And that's what gives you what number you're going to multiply, that n number. So again, they said that the molar mass is 116, right? So 116 goes on the top. And just as a hint, the biggest number is always going to go on the top, okay? The biggest number is always going to go on the top. So that's the true molar mass of maleic acid. And then this is my empirical formula's molar mass, 29.02. And what do you get? Four. Okay. So what do you do? You take your empirical formula... and you multiply it by that number. So C4H4O4. This is the molecular or true formula for maleic acid. Any questions? So it's done pretty much um, the same as an empirical formula. You just have a couple of extra steps to add on to the end. Uh, can you, like, is the slide presentation on, like, the canvas? I'm it will be today. I need, like, you kind of went fast, so I need to put that in.
Okay, well, we're doing another practice one before class is over. And I'm recording, so hopefully my recording works. Okay, so let's try another practice one. Okay, so again, this is the order that we go in. You determine the empirical formula for the compound like we've been doing. Then you calculate the molar mass of your empirical formula, and then you see if it's the same as the molecular. And if it's not, you have to divide them to get that whole number. So we're going to try another practice one. This is, again, all the work. So let's try this. Silver oxalate. Silver oxalate. And I give you it's 71.02 silver, 7.91% carbon, and 21.07 oxygen. So again, I'm going to have you practice on your own. Just right now, determine the empirical formula. That's all I need you to do right now. Please take a moment to determine the empirical formula. All right, so... This is our empirical formula, AgCO2. And so if I, all I said was find the empirical formula, you would be finished. Are you screen? Oh, okay. Sorry, it was still on the whiteboard. Okay, but I talked about a molecular formula. So the next step is once you find your empirical formula, you need to find your empirical formula's molar mass. So you take a silver plus a carbon plus two oxygens and you add it together. So 107.97 plus four, oops, I'm sorry, 12.01 plus 16 times two. So this guy's molar mass is 151.98, okay, for the empirical formula. So you have to go back to the problem. And they go, oh, but the true molar mass of silver oxalate is 303.8. Okay, well, if it's 303.8, remember the big number goes on top. Divided by the molar mass of the empirical formula, which was, what, 151.98. So the molecular formula goes on the top divided by the empirical formula on the bottom, big over small. And what whole number does that give us? Two, right? So what do you do? You take your empirical formula which is AgCO2 A, G, C, O, 2, and you multiply it by that number, that whole number, which is a 2. So the 2 gets distributed to every element in the compound. So what does that give me? Two silvers, two carbons, and four oxygens. This is the true molecular formula of silver oxalate. This is its simplified or empirical formula. How are we doing? Any questions?
Yeah, I couldn't see anything because my calc I was trying to type into my calculator, but I keep but I kept it turning off. Okay, well, um, hopefully my video will come up and you'll be able to rewatch it. Okay, so this is it for notes for this topic. So again, this, I told you that we, chapter seven was like naming and writing formulas and then this uh, little piece, oh, ooh, I lied. There's one more little piece, but we'll do it um, the next time. I'm thinking, here, I'm gonna pause this.